How much hope would you have for a diabetic with blood glucose of between 600 and 800 milligrams per deciliter? His toes were numb, his feet were swollen, he had a terrible fungal infection, and his weight had dropped all the way down to 118, and he was six feet two. And yet this man found a way to get his glucose into a normal range, and today he feels so much better. How in the world did he do that? Well, folks, I am uh, happy and excited to have a man on our program today. His name is Paul Perez. Paul, welcome to Beat Diabetes. Well, thank you, Dennis. I'm uh, glad to be here. Glad to have a chance to, to relate my story. Yeah, well, you've got a very powerful story to tell. And, uh, you know, I talked to you earlier. You were sharing some of the uh, symptoms you had as you were in the really the worst stages of diabetes. You had, your toes had gone numb. You had swelling of your feet. Uh, you had uh, fungal infections, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. You, you were a mess and you lost an, a, an incredible amount of weight. So w was this the reason you finally went to the doctor and got diagnosed as diabetic, uh, all of these symptoms, or did they come later? Or how did that work when you first found out? Unfortunately, no, that isn't, I, I didn't, I didn't buy a clue even at the last minute. Um, I never went to a doctor unless it was for emergency care, you know, to stitch up a cut or fix a broken bone or something like that. It's just <laughs> not the way I was. Um, and I, I, I've been told I could be a, a very stubborn person. Um, and, uh, uh, what happened was, is I was just caught in, in this mental cycle, which part of it, the diabetes is to blame for. One thing that they rarely tell people is that one of the aspects of having very, very high blood sugar is it affects your, your mentation, your ability to think. And it, it affects your mood. It affects... Um, it can cause depression. It can cause, in my case, a very fatalistic outlook on life where I wouldn't say that I was suicidal, but I didn't care. I, I really didn't care. Um, and that's very, very dangerous for something like that. Uh, specifically, I believe that what I have, I've never been tested for, it, but I present is what's called a, a LADA. L-A-D-A, -A, and that stands for Latent Autoimmune Diabetes in Adults. What was it that did get you to finally go to the doctor? You don't normally go unless you got something really big going on. What finally drove you to go to the doctor? I had the, the law laid down on me, and uh, she made it very clear in no uncertain terms. What had happened was that I developed a, a fungal infection in the back of my throat. And it actually developed to the state where I, it was impairing my ability to breathe. And she just figured that stubborn or not stubborn, that's just taking a little bit too far. So I got told. <laughs> All right. You go to the doctor thinking, I need to get this fungal infection taken care of. And uh, it, it turns out you had uh, severe diabetes. I'm sure that must have been a shock. Tell us uh, how the doctor reveal this to you, what he said to you, and what kind of numbers you had at that time? Well, I wasn't really a doctor. I went to the nurse practitioner at the local clinic who's a type 2 diabetic herself, and she's very familiar with the symptoms and the side effects of very high blood sugar. So her radar went up immediately when uh, the, the idea of the thrush infection comes up, which is the, the fungal infection in my throat, because that really doesn't happen to healthy people. That only happens to people who have their immune system compromised by something like extremely high blood sugar. Not only that, the fungus actually feeds on sugar. So having that much systemic blood sugar just made it a paradise for the fungus to take over and, and just go wild. 
Uh, so that was that was what tripped her radar screen. And uh, then she said, okay, well, let's get the meter in here and let's do a finger stick and, and see what's going on. And I said, okay, but I won't do it until you stick my wife. Because I figured if she blackmailed me to go to the doctor, I blackmailed her to get her blood sugar checked. And they tested her, and she was 350, a uh, serious type 2 diabetic. And they finger stuck me, and I was 590, which is really, really high, considering that it was a morning appointment, and I hadn't had any food yet. You said 590, 590. 590. Yeah, that that is incredibly high. In fact, uh, a lot of uh, meters won't even go that high. Some will, and yours obviously did. So you were right close to 600. Mine stopped at, well, I didn't have a meter at the time. I went home and got a meter, and then that's another strange part of the story. The doctor, without having any testing or anything, she gave me metformin, which is a uh, an insulin sensitizer. It's used an awful lot to help type 2s and, and some type 1s who have insulin resistance problems and thought that I was just a really bad type 2 like my wife and sent me home. And I went and got a blood glucose meter and I couldn't get the darn thing to work. Every time I stuck my finger, I get an error code that said H1. And I didn't realize that what it was saying was high. The meter that I got would not read anything over 600. So wow. as the day went on and as I ate and as uh, as the day progressed, my blood sugar was climbing higher and higher and higher. And um, next day I called up the doctor and told her this, and she told me to come right in, like do not pass go. Uh, we're in a very isolated agricultural area. Uh, and uh, going to the hospital is an hour and a half drive. Uh, our local clinic is really about the only frontline medical service that we have. And I went in there, and she's finger stuck me again, and I was close to 800. Close and to 800? Close to 800. Wow. And uh, it was it was pretty bad. And remember, during this whole time, I was not myself. The the brain fog, the, uh, for lack of a better word, word uh, the the fatalism, the the you know just okay, fine. <laughs> you know. <laughs> One thing you have to realize, Paul, you were about as high in glucose level as a person can be and still stand on their feet and still function at all. You were actually doing pretty well to be functioning at all. I mean, you were just about as bad as you can get and still be alive. I help out with a group of people who have LADA, uh, L-A-D-A. And uh, this is typical of people with LADA. And what it is, it's, it's the boil the frog slowly syndrome. Because we don't present instantly, the body has a great deal of ability to adjust and compensate. So we don't display the life-threatening sy symptoms like uh, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is usually what puts people in the uh, ICU, um, because our body is constantly changing and correcting, trying to keep us alive. And it has time to do this. L LADA can develop over a period of years where you just gradually lose the ability to make insulin and your blood sugar gradually rises, and you become acclimatized. By the time that you found out you were diabetic, you obviously were kind of at the end of that uh, process because, you know, you were pretty much almost a type 1 at that point, right? Well, I definitely was a type 1. As a matter of fact, I, I burned out all of my beta cell function uh, before I ever started insulin. I, I if If... She hadn't have put me on insulin the second time that I went in there. I would have either been in intensive care with DKA or I would have been dead. Um, because I make no insulin now between the autoimmune assault on the uh, beta cells of the pancreas and the extremely high blood sugars, which also destroy 
or Im impair the beta cell function of the pancreas. I was making no, uh, no noticeable insulin whatsoever. Right. All right, let's talk about the advice your doctor gave you. You call her a nurse practitioner, but we'll, I'll just call her a doctor. Uh, what, what kind of advice did she give? What did she have to say? Uh, how helpful was she in your situation? I like to stress that she is a nice uh, nurse practitioner just because you shouldn't have as many expectations for the amount of support and training. Uh, a regular doctor, I would have been really, really upset with because she went online and found a, a beginning treatment plan for insulin and printed it out and directed me to go to the American Diabetes Association website and download their type 1 self-care manual, both of which are horrible. Uh, absolutely really bad advice. And, but, you know, she didn't know. This is, the, this is the resources that she got pointed to to, to, to send me off of. Um, and uh, they have no awareness of uh, proper diet. As a matter of fact, they have an anti-awareness. There is such a focus coming out of the ADA for a high carbohydrate diet for a type one, where they will tell you all kinds of horror stories about why you have to have carbohydrates. And what it is is their their insulin management plan is is tailored around this. The types of insulin that they use is tailored around a high carbohydrate diet, and. and they're not telling you the best care for you. They're telling you the best care to fit into their one-size-fits-all treatment. All right. So she is uh, recommending kind of an ADA approach, the the old standard approach. I think the ADA is changing a bit, but the old standard approach was eat a lot of carbs, take a lot of meds, eat a lot of carbs, take a lot of insulin if, if the need uh, is there. Uh, and And you tried that for a while. It didn't work very well for you, did it? Oh, no, I failed miserably trying to do that. I mean, I decided if everybody cares about me enough to keep me alive, I have an obligation to do my best to stay alive, whether I wanted to or not. You know, it was one of those, it became an issue of duty, uh, and I take that very seriously. And um, no matter what I did, first of all, all of the advice just didn't ring true. I've been involved in technology companies where I was called in to assess a new technology proposed for a venture capital company or a group of investors. And my job wasn't to find the charlatans. My job was to find the people who were well-intended but wrong because the, the investors didn't really care whether the person was of goodwill. They wanted to know whether what he was proposing to them made financial sense from a technological standpoint. So I had this background of not trying to come up with this scenario of somebody who's deceiving me or not deceiving me, find out who's deceiving themselves. And that bell started ringing so loud and so clear for my first dip of the toe into this uh, medical advice for managing type 1 diabetes. It just, it just impressed me as being so profoundly wrong as to border on voodoo. Well, you know, uh, Paul, I think you make a good point. I, there are a lot of our viewers that would suggest that everybody's got a bad motive. Everybody uh, is, you know, in the pockets of big pharma and all that. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are some, but uh, I don't believe everybody's got a bad motive that d tries to point you the wrong direction. I think in many cases, they're just saying what they've learned, what they've been taught, and so forth. And, uh, you know, their intentions are the best. But let's talk about uh, the guy that kind of put you on the right track. You, you, got, you got some information. I think you read a book from a particular doctor that was saying almost the exact opposite of what you had been told. Tell us who that was and what it was you read and how it affected you. Well, the person I found was a fellow named Artie Dykeman, and he is um, basically a theoretical physicist, a PhD in theoretical physics. And he was relating his story 
about the astounding ability he has to mathematically model things, and he could not make anything that he was taught for his nine-year-old type one son work. That everything that he did, and he be, he finally understood that what it is is a chaotic system, which means it defies analysis. There is no way to calculate the proper result. Uh, it's constantly changing. It's constantly fluctuating. You've got two sides of error that are talking to each other. You have the error from the inputs, the dose, the food, everything else. And then you have the inconsistency of how the body reacts to that. And your blood glucose is the balance between those two things. So when you when you put it that way, it, 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 it triggered the engineer in me to pay attention. Because this is the person who was not uh, deluding himself. Uh, he, he tried all kinds of things, uh, all the recommended advice. None of it worked. Uh, and then finally he did find something. Tell us what he found and what began to work for him uh, in helping his son. He found Dr. Richard K. Bernstein and Dr. Bernstein's book, Diabetes Solution. Actually, his wife found it, ordered it off of uh, Amazon, and he started reading it, and the light bulb went off. He uh -huh. says, you know, this makes sense for what I do, understanding the greater issues of, of advanced physics, and that is that when you're dealing with a chaotic system, the only thing that you can do to make it more manageable is to simplify. And what Richard Bernstein found out, and you know, you, you've talked about the background of this man. He's probably the oldest living type 1 diabetic, and he could probably beat the crap out of me. I mean, this guy <laughs> is almost 90 works out with weights every day, has a, a full-time practice still, and he's been a diabetic since age 11, yeah, a type he's 1. He's an amazing guy, amazing guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, and his dedication, um, he's not a very good at promoting himself. So. I've had the same thought. Uh, I, I've looked at his uh, YouTube channel, and he doesn't have that many people. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm thinking, this just is wrong. This guy knows more about diabetes than practically anybody in the whole world. And he, he ought to have several million uh, followers. And uh, But you're right. He's not the, the greatest self-promoter, but boy, he sure knows a lot. All right, let's let's move along to the point you, you read uh, Dykeman and he says you know I've got an engineering background or a, a technological background he tried all kinds of things couldn't work found Bernstein and it did work for his son so now you're being pointed to Bernstein uh, via Dykeman what is it about what Bernstein has to say it, it you know there's a there's a happy end to your story you you're finding you're going to find tremendous victory uh, but what was it about Bernstein that really helped you get some things straight and led you to the way of victory? A very simple, common sense premise that everything is based on, and it's called the law of small numbers. <clears throat> and that is that when you have a process or a situation or a condition that's very chaotic, the amount of variation and the amount of uh, error is always going to be proportional to the inputs to that chaos. So the chaos, if you're free feeding, if you're eating the standard American diet, if you're eating the high carbohydrate recommendations from the ADA, which they still make, by the way, um, what you're doing is you're increasing the size of the inputs into a chaotic system. When you do that, the error remains a percentage of the size of those inputs. So by increasing the size, the magnitude of those inputs, you're not only increasing the, the magnitude of the uncertainty, the error, you're also decreasing the amount of speed it acts on. Because in order for something to climb sharply, it has to climb at a very fast slope. So what you're doing is you're making very sharp, jagged, intense variations in this system and any type of management that you try and put in place to control that is always going to fail because even if you get the magnitudes right you have to get the timing right you have to match a very sharp correction to a very sharp rise 
that's always going to be inconsistent as to how high it goes and how fast it goes up. Yeah. So the 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 short version of all that is Bernstein found that if you limit your carbs severely, very low carb, and he normally recommends 30 grams per day, uh, I think six in the morning and 12, and then 12 for the other two meals, uh, it's a lot easier to manage. You read that, and it, it didn't apparently take you very long to, to really believe it and start practicing it. Is that correct? Oh, no, the, the bell of truth rang as soon as I, I read it. Because okay. the other thing that you have to keep in mind, uh, the focus on carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates is a stupid term. I don't know why we got talked into that. We don't eat carbohydrates. We eat foods. And all of these foods have different effects. And there are some carbohydrates that have no effect, such as insoluble fiber. You can eat as much as you want to and have absolutely no effect on your metabolism. That's a carb. You can also eat other carbs like starches, which your body will absorb and turn to glucose even faster than eating table sugar. So the type of carbohydrate is probably more important than the amount. So the 6-12-12 method of limiting carbohydrates wouldn't do anything if those carbohydrates were in the form of starches or sugars. Okay, so you not only are you going to have to limit your carbs, but you're going to have to uh, be very selective in the carbs you do allow yourself. So the six, twelve, twelve you're saying wouldn't really work if those were potato carbs or bread carbs, but they would work pretty well if they're uh, low carb salad uh, type carbs. Uh, is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, starch turns to glucose before you even swallow it. So bread, grains, rice, potatoes, oatmeal, uh, tubers, even beans, although to a lesser extent, all of those starchy carbohydrates have the ability, you, your, your mouth makes an enzyme, your whole body makes it, but it starts working in your mouth called amylase. And what amylase does is it, breaks down starches into pure glucose. So anybody who wants to eat a healthy whole grain is really diluting themselves because that's what goes in your mouth. Your body reacts to what goes into its system, and what goes into your body's system isn't a healthy whole grain. What goes into your body's system is only glucose. That's all it gets from it. Well, pretty good stuff, but as you probably guessed, there's more to this story. But in order to keep it from going too long, I broke it into two pieces. So come back on Tuesday and we'll share the rest of the story.